The news as to the identity of the body lying now in Al Mayer's compound spread rapidly over the settlement. During the forenoon, most of the inhabitants remained in the long street, discussing the mysterious return and the unexpected death of the man who had become known to them as the traitor. His arrival during the northeast monsoon, his long sojourn in their midst, his sudden departure with his brig, and above all, the mysterious appearance of the body, said to be his amongst the logs, were subjects to wonder at and to talk over and over again with undiminished interest. Mamat moved from house to house and from group to group, always ready to repeat his tale, and now he saw the body caught by the sarong in a forked log, how Mrs. Almayer coming, one of the first, at his cries, recognized it, even before he had hauled it on shore, how Babalachi ordered him to bring it out of the water. By the feet, I dragged him in, and there was no head, exclaimed Mamat. And how could the white man's wife know who it was? She was a witch, it was well known. And did you see how the white man himself ran away at the sight of the body? Like a deer he ran, and here Mamat imitated Almayer's long strides, to the great joy of the beholders, and for all his trouble he had nothing. The ring with the green stone to one Babalachi kept. Nothing, nothing. He spat down at his feet in a sign of disgust, and left that group to seek further on a fresh audience. The news, spreading to the furthermost parts of the settlement, found out Abdullah in the cool recess of his go-down, where he sat overlooking his Arab clerks and the men loading and unloading the upcountry canoes. Rashid, who was busy on the jetty, was summoned into his uncle's presence and found him, as usual, very calm and even cheerful, but very much surprised. The rumor of the capture or destruction of Dane's brig had reached the Arab's ears three days before from the sea fishermen and through the dwellers on the lower reaches of the river. It had been passed upstream from neighbor to neighbor till Bulangi, whose clearing was nearest to the settlement, had brought that news himself to Abdullah, whose favor he courted. But rumor also spoke of a fight and of Dane's death on board his own vessel, and now all the settlement talked of Dane's visit to the Raja and of his death when crossing the river in the dark to see Almayer. They could not understand this. Rashid thought that it was very strange. He felt uneasy and doubtful. But Abdullah, after the first shock of surprise with the old age's dislike for solving riddles, showed a becoming resignation. He remarked that the man was dead now at all events and consequently no more dangerous. Where was the use to wonder at the decrees of fate, especially if they were propitious to the true believers? And with a pious ejaculation to Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, Abdullah seemed to regard the incident as closed for the present. Not so Rashid. He lingered by his uncle, pulling thoughtfully his neatly trimmed beard. There are many lies, he murmured. He has been dead once before and came to life to die again now. The Dutch will be here before many days and clamor for the man. Shall I not believe my eyes sooner than the tongues of women and idle men? They say that the body is being taken to Almayer's compound, said Abdullah. If you want to go there, you must go before the Dutch arrive here. Go late. It should not be said that we have been seen inside that man's enclosure lately. Rashid assented to the truth of this last remark and left his uncle's side. He leaned against the lintel of the big doorway and looked idly across the courtyard through the open gate onto the main road of the settlement. It lay empty, straight, and yellow under the flood of light. In the hot noontide, the smooth trunks of palm trees, the outlines of the houses, and away there at the other end of the road, the roof of Almayer's house, visible over the bushes on the dark background of forest, 
seemed to quiver in the heat radiating from the steaming earth. Swarms of yellow butterflies rose and settled to rise again in short flights before Rashid's half-closed eyes. From under his feet arose the dull hum of insects and the long grass of the courtyard. He looked on sleepily. From one of the side paths amongst the houses, a woman stepped out on the road, a slight girlish figure walking under the shade of a large tray balanced on its head. The consciousness of something moving stirred Rashid's half-sleeping senses into a comparative wakefulness. He recognized Tamina, Balangi's slave girl, with her tray of cakes for sale, an apparition of daily recurrence and of no importance whatever. She was going towards El Mayer's house. She could be made useful. He roused himself up and ran towards the gate, calling out, Tamina, oh! The girl stopped, hesitated, and came back slowly. Rashid waited, signing to her impatiently to come nearer. When near Rashid, Tamina stood with downcast eyes. Rashid looked at her a while before he asked, Are you going to Almeyer's house? They say in the settlement that Dane the traitor that he was found drowned this morning is lying in the white man's kampong. I have heard this talk, whispered Tamina, and this morning by the riverside I saw the body. Where it is now I do not know. So you have seen it, asked Rashid eagerly. Is it Dane? You have seen him many times. You would know him. The girl's lips quivered and she remained silent for a while, breathing quickly. I have seen him not a long time ago, she said at last. The talk is true. He is dead. What do you want from me, Tuan? I must go. Just then the report of the gun fired on board the steam launch was heard, interrupting Rashid's reply. Leaving the girl, he ran to the house and met in the courtyard Abdullah coming towards the gate. The Rang Blanga are come, said Rashid. And now we shall have our reward. Abdullah shook his head doubtfully. The white men's rewards are long in coming, he said. White men are quick in anger and slow in gratitude. We shall see. He stood at the gate, stroking his gray beard and listening to the distant cries of greeting at the other end of the settlement. As Tamina was turning to go, he called her back. Listen, girl, he said. There will be many white men in Almayer's house. You shall be there selling your cakes to the men of the sea. What you see and what you hear you may tell me. Come here before the sun sets and I will give you a blue handkerchief with red spots. Now go and forget not to return. He gave her a push with the end of his long staff as she was going away and made her stumble. This slave is very slow, he remarked to his nephew looking after the girl with great disfavor. Tamina walked on, her tray on the head, her eyes fixed on the ground. From the open doors of the houses were heard, as she passed, friendly calls inviting her within for business purposes, but she never heeded them, neglecting her sales in the preoccupation of intense thinking. Since the very early morning she had heard much, she had also seen much that filled her heart with a joy mingled with great suffering and fear. Before the dawn, before she left Bulanga's house to paddle up to Sambir, she had heard voices outside the house, and when all in it but herself were asleep. And now, with her knowledge of the words spoken in the darkness, she held in her hand a life and carried in her breast a great sorrow. Yet from her springy step, erect figure, and face veiled over by the everyday load she carried under the visible burden of the tray piled up high with cakes manufactured by the thrifty hands of Bulungi's wives, in that supple figure, straight as an arrow, so graceful and free in its walk, behind those soft eyes that spoke of nothing but of unconscious resignation, there slept all feelings and all passions, all hopes and all fears, the curse of life and the consolation of death. 
and she knew nothing of it all. She lived like the tall palms amongst whom she was passing now, seeking the light, desiring the sun, fearing the storm, unconscious of either. The slave had no hope and knew of no change. She knew of no other sky, no other water, no other forest, no other world, no other life. She had no wish, no hope, no love, no fear except of a blow, and no vivid feeling but that of occasional hunger, which was seldom, for Balangi was rich, and rice was plentiful in the solitary house in his clearing. The absence of pain and hunger was her happiness, and when she felt unhappy she was simply tired, more than usual after the day's labor. Then in the hot nights of the southwest monsoon she slept dreamlessly under the bright stars on the platform built outside the house and over the river. Inside they slept too, Balangi by the door, his wives further in, the children with their mothers. She could hear their breathing, Balangi's sleepy voice, the sharp cry of a child, soon hushed with tender words, and she closed her eyes to the murmur of the water below, to the whisper of the warm wind above, ignorant of the never-ceasing life of that tropical nature that spoke to her in vain with a thousand faint voices of the nearer forest, with the breath of tepid wind and the heavy scents that lingered around her head and the white wraiths of morning mist that hung over her in the solemn hush of all creation before the dawn. Such had been her existence before the coming of the brig with the strangers. She remembered well that time, the uproar in the settlement, the never-ending wonder, the days and nights of talk and excitement. She remembered her own timidity with the strange men, till the brig moored to the bank became in a manner part of the settlement, and the fear wore off in the familiarity of constant intercourse. The call on board, then, became part of her daily round. She walked hesitatingly up the slanting planks of the gangway, amidst the encouraging shouts and more or less decent jokes of the men idling over the bulwarks. There she sold her wares to those men that spoke so loud and carried themselves so free. There was a throng, a constant coming and going, calls interchanged, orders given and executed with shouts, the rattle of blocks, the flinging about of coils of rope. She sat out of the way under the shade of the awning, with her tray before her, the veil drawn well over her face, feeling shy among so many men. She smiled at all buyers, but spoke to none, letting their jests pass with stolid unconcern. She heard many tales told around her of far-off countries, of strange customs, of events stranger still. Those men were brave, but the most fearless of them spoke of their chief with fear. Often the man they called their master passed before her, walking erect and indifferent, in the pride of youth, in the flash of rich dress, with a tinkle of gold ornaments, while everybody stood aside, watching anxiously for a movement of his lips, ready to do his bidding. Then all her life seemed to rush into her eyes, and from under her veil she gazed at him, charmed, yet fearful to attract attention. One day he noticed her and asked, Who is that girl? A slave, Tuan, a girl that sells cakes. A dozen voices replied together. She rose in terror to run on shore when he called her back, and as she stood trembling with head hung down before him, he spoke kind words, lifting her chin with his hand and looking into her eyes with a smile. Do not be afraid, he said. He never spoke to her any more. Somebody called out from the river bank. He turned away and forgot her existence. Tamina saw a mayor standing on the shore with Nina on his arm. She heard Nina's voice calling out gaily and saw Dane's face brighten with joy as he leaped on shore. She hated the sound of that voice ever since. 
and that day she left off visiting Almayer's compound and passed the noon hours under the shade of the brig awning. She watched for his coming with heart beating quicker and quicker as he approached into a wild tumult of newly aroused feelings of joy and hope and fear that died away with Dane's retreating figure, leaving her tired out, as if after a struggle, sitting still for a long time in a dreamy languor. Then she paddled home, slowly in the afternoon, often letting her canoe float with a lazy stream in the quiet backwater of the river. The paddle hung idle in the water as she sat in the stern, one hand supporting her chin, her eyes wide open, listening intently to the whispering of her heart that seemed to swell at last into a song of extreme sweetness. Listening to that song, she husked the rice at home. It dulled her ears to the shrill bickerings of Belongi's wives, to the sound of angry reproaches addressed to her, and when the sun was near, its setting, she walked to the bathing place and heard it as she stood on the tender grass of the low bank, her robe at her feet, and looked at the reflection of her figure on the glass-like surface of the creek. Listening to it, she walked slowly back, her wet hair hanging over her shoulders, laying down to rest under the bright stars. She closed her eyes to the murmur of the water below, of the warm wind above, to the voice of nature speaking through the faint noises of the great forest and to the song of her own heart. She heard, but did not understand, and drank in the dreamy joy of her new existence without troubling about its meaning or its end, till the full consciousness of life came to her through pain and anger, and she suffered horribly the first time she saw Nina's long canoe drift silently past the sleeping house of Bulangi, bearing the two lovers into the white mist of the great river. Her jealousy and rage culminated into a paroxysm of physical pain that left her lying panting on the river bank in the dumb agony of a wounded animal. But she went on moving patiently in the enchanted circle of slavery going through her task day after day with all the pathos of the grief she could not express even to herself locked within her breast she shrank from nina as she would have shrunk from the sharp blade of a knife cutting into her flesh but she kept on visiting the brig to feed her dumb ignorant soul on her own despair she saw dane many times he never spoke he never looked could his eyes see only one woman's image could his ears hear only one woman's voice? He never noticed her, not once. And then he went away. She saw him and Nina for the last time on that morning when Babalachi, while visiting his fish baskets, had his suspicions of the white man's daughter's affair with Dane confirmed beyond the shadow of doubt. Dane disappeared, and Tamina's heart where lay useless and barren the seeds of all love and all hate, the possibilities of all passions and of all sacrifices, forgot its joys and its sufferings when deprived of the help of the senses. Her half-formed savage mind, the slave of her body, as her body was the slave of another's will, forgot the faint and vague image of the ideal that had found its beginning and the physical promptings of her savage nature. She dropped back into the torpor of her former life and found consolation, even a certain kind of happiness, in the thought that now Nina and Dane were separated, probably forever. He would forget. This thought soothed the last pangs of dying jealousy that had nothing now to feed upon, and Tamina found peace. It was like the dreary tranquility of a desert where there is peace only because there is no life. And now he had returned. She had recognized his voice calling aloud in the night for Bolangi. She had crept out after her master to listen closer to the intoxicating sound. Dane was there in a boat talking to Bolangi. 
Tamina, listening with arrested breath, heard another voice. The maddening joy that only a second before she thought herself incapable of containing within her fast-beating heart died out and left her shivering in the old anguish of physical pain that she had suffered once before at the sight of Dane and Nina. Nina spoke now, ordering and entreating in turns, and Belangi was refusing, expostulating, at last consenting. He went in to take a paddle from the heap lying behind the door. Outside the murmur of two voices went on, and she caught a word here and there. She understood that he was fleeing from white men, that he was seeking a hiding place, that he was in some danger. But she heard also words which woke the rage of jealousy that had been asleep for so many days in her bosom, crouching low on the mud in the black darkness amongst the piles. She heard the whisper in the boat that made light of toil, of privation, of danger, of life itself. Life in exchange there could be, but a short moment of close embrace, a look from the eye, the feel of light breath, the touch of soft lips. So spoke Dane as he sat in the canoe, holding Nina's hands, while waiting for Balangi's return, and Tamina, supporting herself by the slimy pile, felt as if a heavy weight was crushing her down, down into the black oily water at her feet. She wanted to cry out, to rush at them, and tear their vague shadows apart, to throw Nina into the smooth water, cling to her close, hold her to the bottom where that man could not find her. She could not cry, she could not move. Then footsteps were heard on the bamboo platform above her head. She saw Balangi get into the smallest canoe and take the lead, the other boat following, paddled by Dane and Nina. With a slight splash of the paddles dipped stealthily in the water, their indistinct forms passed before her aching eyes and vanished in the darkness of the creek. She remained there in the cold and wet, powerless to move, breathing painfully under the crushing weight that the mysterious hand of fate had laid so suddenly upon her slender shoulders, and shivering she felt within a burning fire that seemed to feed upon her very life, when the breaking day had spread a pale golden ribbon over the black outline of the forests. She took up her tray and departed towards the settlement, going about her task purely from the force of habit. As she approached Sembir, she could see the excitement, and she heard, with momentary surprise, of the finding of Dane's body. It was not true, of course. She knew it well. She regretted that he was not dead. She should have liked Dane to be dead, so as to be parted from that woman, from all women. She felt a strong desire to see Nina, but without any clear object. She hated her and feared her, and she felt an irresistible impulse pushing her towards Almeyer's house to see the white woman's face, to look close at those eyes, to hear again that voice, for the sound of which Dane was ready to risk his liberty, his life even. She had seen her many times. She had heard her voice daily for many months past. What was there in that being to make a man speak as Dane had spoken, to make him blind to all other faces, deaf to all other voices? She left the crowd by the riverside and wandered aimlessly among the empty houses, resisting the impulse that pushed her towards Almeyer's campong to seek there in Nina's eyes the secret of her own misery. The sun mounting higher shortened the shadows and poured down upon her a flood of light and of stifling heat as she passed on from shadow to light, from light to shadow amongst the houses, the bushes, the tall trees, in her unconscious flight from the pain in her own heart. In the extremity of her distress, she could find no words to pray for relief. She knew of no heaven to send her prayer to, and she wandered on with tired feet in the dumb surprise and terror at the injustice of the suffering inflicted upon her, 
without cause and without redress. The short talk with Rashid, the proposal of Abdullah, steadied her a little and turned her thoughts into another channel. Dane was in some danger. He was hiding from white men. So much she had overheard last night. They all thought him dead. She knew he was alive, and she knew of his hiding place. What did the Arabs want to know about the white men? The white men want with Dane. Did they wish to kill him? She could tell them all. No, she would say nothing, and in the night she would go to him and sell him his life for a word, for a smile, for a gesture even, and be his slave in far-off countries, away from Nina. But there were dangers. The one-eyed Babalachi, who knew everything, the white man's wife, she was a witch, perhaps they would tell, and then there was Nina, she must hurry on and see. In her impatience, she left the path and ran towards Al Mayer's dwelling through the undergrowth between the palm trees. She came out at the back of the house, where a narrow ditch full of stagnant water that overflowed from the river separated Al Mayer's campong from the rest of the settlement. The thick bushes growing on the bank were hiding from her sight the large courtyard with its cooking shed. Above them rose several thin columns of smoke, and from behind the sound of strange voices informed Tamina that the men of the sea, belonging to the warship, had already landed and were camped between the ditch and the house. To the left one of Almeyer's slave girls came down to the ditch and bent over the shiny water, washing a kettle. To the right, the tops of the banana plantation, visible above the bushes, swayed and shook under the touch of invisible hands gathering the fruit. On the calm water, several canoes, moored to a heavy stake, were crowded together, nearly bridging the ditch, just at the place where Tamina stood. The voices in the courtyard rose at times into an outburst of calls, replies, and laughter and then died away into a silence that soon was broken again by a fresh clamor. Now and again the thin blue smoke rushed out thicker and blacker and drove in odorous masses over the creek, wrapping her for a moment in a suffocating veil. Then, as the fresh wood caught well alight, the smoke vanished in the bright sunlight, and only the scent of aromatic wood drifted afar to leeward of the crackling fires. Tamina rested her tray on a stump of a tree and remained standing with her eyes turned towards Almeyer's house, whose roof and part of a whitewashed wall were visible over the bushes. The slave girl finished her work and after looking for a while curiously at Tamina, pushed her way through the dense thicket back to the courtyard. Round Tamina, there was now a complete solitude. She threw herself down on the ground and hid her face in her hands. Now, when so close she had no courage to see Nina, at every burst of louder voices from the courtyard she shivered in the fear of hearing Nina's voice. She came to the resolution of waiting where she was till dark, and then going straight to Dane's hiding place, from where she was she could watch the movements of white men, of Nina, of all Dane's friends, and of all his enemies. Both were hateful alike to her, for both would take him away beyond her reach. She hid herself in the long grass to wait anxiously for the sunset that seemed so slow to come. On the other side of the ditch, behind the bush by the clear fires, the seamen of the frigate had encamped on the hospitable invitation of Almayer. Almayer, roused out of his apathy by the prayers and importunity of Nina, had managed to get down in time to the jetty so as to receive the officers at their landing. The lieutenant in command accepted his invitation to his house with the remark that in any case their business was with Almayer, and perhaps not very pleasant, he added. Almayer hardly heard him. He shook hands with them absently and led the way towards the house. 
He was scarcely conscious of the polite words of welcome he greeted the strangers with, and afterwards repeated several times over again in his efforts to appear at ease. The agitation of their host did not escape the officer's eyes, and the chief confided to his subordinate in a low voice his doubts as to Almer's sobriety. The young sub-lieutenant laughed and expressed in a whisper the hope that the white man was not intoxicated enough to neglect the offer of some refreshments. He does not seem very dangerous, he added, as they followed Almayer up the steps of the veranda. No, he seems more of a fool than a knave. I have heard of him, returned the senior. They sat around the table. Almayer, with shaking hands, made gin cocktails, offered them all round, and drank himself with every gulp, feeling stronger, steadier, and better able to face all the difficulties of his position. Ignorant of the fate of the brig, he did not suspect the real object of the officer's visit. He had a general notion that something must have leaked out about the gunpowder trade, but apprehended nothing beyond some temporary inconveniences. After emptying his glass, he began to chat easily, lying back in his chair, with one of his legs thrown negligently over the arm. The lieutenant, astride on his chair, a glowing cheroot in the corner of his mouth, listened with a sly smile from behind the thick volumes of smoke that escaped from his compressed lips. The young sub-lieutenant, leaning with both elbows on the table, his head between his hands, looked on sleepily in the torpor induced by fatigue and the gin. Almayer talked on. It is a great pleasure to see white faces here. I have lived here many years in great solitude. The Malays, you understand, are not company for a white man. Moreover, they are not friendly. They do not understand our ways. Great rascals they are. I believe I am the only white man on the East Coast that is a settled resident. We get visitors from Makassar or Singapore sometimes, traders, agents, or explorers, but they are rare. There was a scientific explorer here a year or more ago. He lived in many house, drank from morning to night. He lived joyously for a few months, and when the liquor he brought with him was gone, he returned to Batavia with a report on the mineral wealth of the interior. Ha, ha, ha. Good is it not? He ceased abruptly and looked at his guests with a meaningless stare. While they laughed, he was reciting to himself the old story. Dane dead, all my plans destroyed. This is the end of all hope and of all things. His heart sank within him. He felt a kind of deadly sickness. Very good, capital, exclaimed both officers. Almayer came out of his despondency with another burst of talk. Eh, what about the dinner? You have got a cook with you. That's all right. There is a cooking shed in the other courtyard. I can give you a geese. Look at my geese, the only geese on the east coast, perhaps on the whole island. Is that your cook? Very good. Here, Ollie, show this Chinaman the cooking place and tell Mem Almayer to let him have room there. My wife, gentlemen, does not come out. My daughter may. Meantime, have some more drink. It is a hot day. The lieutenant took the cigar out of his mouth, looked at the ash critically, shook it off, and turned towards Almayer. We have a rather unpleasant business with you, he said. I am sorry, returned Almayer. It can be nothing very serious, surely. If you think an attempt to blow up forty men at least, not a serious matter, you will not find many people of your opinion, retorted the officer sharply. Blow up? What? I know nothing about it, exclaimed Almayer. Who did that, or tried to do it? A man with whom you had some dealings, answered the lieutenant. He passed here under the name of Dane Marula. You sold him the gunpowder he had in that brig we captured. How did you hear about the brig? asked Almayer. I know nothing about the powder he may have had. An Arab trader of this place has sent the information about your goings on here to Batavia a couple of months ago, said the officer. We were waiting for the brig outside, but he slipped past us at the mouth of the river and we had to chase the fellow to the southward. When he sighted us, he ran inside the reefs and put the brig ashore. The crew escaped in boats before we could take possession. As our boats neared, 
the craft, it blew up with a tremendous explosion. One of the boats being too near got swamped. Two men drowned. That is the result of your speculation, Mr. Almayer. Now we want this Dane. We have good grounds to suppose he is hiding in Sambir. Do you know where he is? You had better put yourself right with the authorities as much as possible by being perfectly frank with me. Where is this Dane? Almayer got up and walked towards the balustrade of the veranda. He seemed not to be thinking of the officer's question. He looked at the body laying straight and rigid under its white cover on which the sun, declining amongst the clouds to the westward, threw a pale tinge of red. The lieutenant waited for the answer, taking quick pulls at his half-extinguished cigar. Behind them, Ollie moved noiselessly, laying the table, ranging solemnly the ill-assorted and shabby crockery, the tin spoons, the forks with broken prongs, and the knives with saw-like blades and loose handles. He had almost forgotten how to prepare the table for white men. He felt aggrieved. Memnina would not help him. He stepped back to look at his work admiringly, feeling very proud. This must be right, and if the master afterwards is angry and swears, then so much the worse for Memnina. Why did she not help? He left the veranda to fetch the dinner. Well, Mr. Almayer, will you answer my question as frankly as it is put to you? asked the lieutenant after a long silence. Almayer turned round and looked at his interlocutor steadily. If you catch this Dane, what will you do with him, he asked. The officer's face flushed. This is not an answer, he said, annoyed. And what will you do with me, went on Almayer, not heeding the interruption. Are you inclined to bargain, growled the other. It would be bad policy, I assure you. At present, I have no orders about your person, but we expected your assistance in catching this Malay. Ah, interrupted Almayer, just so. You can do nothing without me, and I know, knowing the man well, I am to help you in finding him. This is exactly what we expect, assented the officer. You have broken the law, Mr. Almayer, and you ought to make amends. And save myself? Well, in a sense, yes. Your head is not in any danger, said the lieutenant with a short laugh. Very well, said Almayer, with decision. I shall deliver the man up to you. Both officers rose to their feet quickly and looked for their sidearms, which they had unbuckled. Almayer laughed harshly. Steady, gentlemen, he exclaimed. In my own time and in my own way. After dinner, gentlemen, you shall have him. This is preposterous, urged the lieutenant. Mr. Almayer, this is no joking matter. The man is a criminal. He deserves to hang. While we dine, he may escape. The rumor of our arrival. Almayer walked towards the table. I give you my word of honor, gentlemen, that he shall not escape. I have him safe enough. The arrest should be effected before dark, remarked the young sub. I shall hold you responsible for any failure. We are ready, but can do nothing just now without you, added the senior with evident annoyance. Almayer made a gesture of assent. On my word of honor, he repeated vaguely. And now let us dine, he added briskly. Nina came through the doorway and stood for a moment holding the curtain aside for Ollie and the old Malay woman bearing the dishes. Then she moved towards the three men by the table. Allow me, said Almayer pompously. This is my daughter, Nina. These gentlemen, officers of the frigate outside, have done me the honor of it to accept my hospitality. Nina answered the low bows of the two officers by a slow inclination of the head and took her place at the table opposite her father. All sat down. The coxswain of the steam launch came up carrying some bottles of wine. You will allow me to have this put upon the table, said the lieutenant to Almayer. What? Wine? You are very kind. Certainly, I have none myself. Times are very hard. The last words of his reply were spoken by Almayer in a faltering voice. The thought that Dane was dead recurred to him vividly again, and he felt as if an invisible hand was gripping his throat. He reached for the gin bottle while they were uncorking the wine and swallowed a big gulp. The lieutenant, who was speaking to Nina, gave him a quick glance. 
The young sub began to recover from the astonishment and confusion caused by Nina's unexpected appearance and great beauty. She was very beautiful and imposing, he reflected, but after all, a half-caste girl. This thought caused him to pluck up heart and look at Nina sideways. Nina, with composed face, was answering in a low, even voice the elder officer's polite questions as to the country and her mode of life. Almayer pushed his plate away and drank his guest's wine in gloomy silence.